All right, now I'm continuing on a series that I've been doing for the past few weeks. And we started off here reading in Numbers chapter 35, but I'm going to read for you from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. The Bible reads, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And the series is on six things that God hates. So we've already done the first two. It says here in verse 17, A proud look, a lying tongue. I went over these in the past two weeks. A proud look, a lying tongue. And now we're on the third week. It says, In hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So these are the, the topics. If you want to know what's coming up in the next weeks, we're going to be going over the rest of those as they arise. But tonight we're dealing with hands that shed innocent blood. Now it's important to understand even just this concept of killing and you know a lot of people will will mock the bible and i've heard people say oh there's contradictions in the bible and one of the places they'll turn to say well the ten commandments is thou shalt not kill right and that's that's real easy i mean everyone knows that commandment thou shalt not kill it's pretty simple it's pretty straightforward but they'll say well then why is god telling people you know to put people to death and they'll say you know there's people today that'll be against the death penalty because they think that they're following the bible and the ten commandments where it says thou shalt not kill now, it's a real simple, you know, when you read in context, you read the Bible, it's, it's, it's a very easy solution. It's not a problem. It's not a contradiction at all. But basically, that word kill is not just talking about taking someone's life by just taking another life. It's talking about murder. And um, taking life in some instances is actually not a sin. For example, the Bible says in Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So God ordained there to be a death penalty. God said, you know, and in the beginning, before, uh, before the flood, there wasn't a death penalty. And you, what you see happening is after some generations, you know, it starts with Cain and Abel, and we'll go into that a little bit later, um, about Cain killing his brother Abel. And there was no death penalty. Basically, he was just a vagabond. He was, he was exiled and forced to just go and live other places. And God even said, you know, that nobody is allowed to take his life. And he put a mark upon Cain so that people knew, okay, well, we can't revenge the blood of Abel and, and kill Cain. That was the way that things were prior to the flood. But after the flood, that's what we see there in Genesis chapter 9. Noah gets off the ark and, and God's going over things. He says, okay, here's the new deal. Here's the way things are going to be from now on. When there's a murder, if someone takes another man's life, someone sheds the blood, that's what we're referring to is killing somebody, then by man shall his blood be shed. He says, I'm leaving it up to you. You are going to have a government that you're going to institute that is going to take care of these criminals and they're going to be put to death. But in order to do that, obviously there has to be an executioner. Some man is going to have to perform the execution of actually carrying out the sentence of the death penalty. So the person that does that, though, is not guilty of thou shalt not kill because he's not a murderer. A murderer is someone who's taking away the life of the innocent. A criminal is not innocent. They're guilty. They're guilty of their crime, which is why their life needs to be taken. And we see that all through Numbers 35. It really goes into detail about all the different things that could happen and describes who is a murderer, who's not a murderer. He's saying, okay, look, if you have this situation and you know, someone puts, you know, rolls a rock on someone else and they die, or someone beats them with a club, or they do any of these other things and they die, you have to look at the cause of that and the, and the purpose. If they were enemies... And that guy is like, you know, setting a trap, laying in wait and, and out to kill him and just and, and murdering that person. Yeah, they're a murderer and they deserve to die. But he says, you know, if it was just an accident, because let's face it, accidents happen. People die. I mean, we get in car wrecks and sometimes people die. It doesn't mean that you had it out for that person. It doesn't mean that you're like intentionally trying to kill them. But they died and he gives all the different, you know, they need to go to this other city and they're going to stand on trial and it'll, all the evidence will be presented and they're going to determine was this an accident or was it murder. And if it was just an accident, then, um, you know, he's not going to lose his life for it because he's not guilty of death. There's not, not guilty of, a, of that type of a sin. <clears throat> Now, it's important that we recognize here the Bible says at the very end of Numbers 35, 
He says in verse 33, So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed. He's saying the only way, the only thing that can satisfy when someone's life is taken, when someone is murdered, when someone's killed, the only thing that satisfies that is the person who did it being put to death. And he's saying you're not going to defile the land. He's saying because basically it, it's an imagery of the spilled blood that's shed from the person who's murdered is defiling the land. But he says the only thing that could kind of help to cleanse that is the justice of the person, the perpetrator, the murderer being put to death for their blood to be shed so that the land's not defiled. And he says in verse 34, Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel. And God's saying, look, I'm living among you guys. I'm right there with you, and this is what I'm ordaining. And if you want me to stay with you, then this is what you need to do. And unfortunately in America, we're, you know, we used to have the death penalty. We used to, to have that, uh, punishments for crime that were more biblically based, that were more in line with what the Bible prescribes. But these days, you know, someone gets a death penalty and very rarely is a person ever put to death. Now, I know there's problems with our system, and I'm not going to get into all politics of it and, you know, the, the wicked government putting innocent people to death and all this other stuff, but God's way is a right way, and it's a righteous way, and we shouldn't just forsake God's way of doing things. Actually, we should go back to doing that more and, and get closer to what He has prescribed because it is just and it is righteous. But notice here, just to give you a good example of the definition of killing somebody in the Bible, you know, thou shalt not kill, just to prove my point of killing, referring to a murderer, look at verse number 30 of Numbers 35 where we read. The Bible reads, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. So right there it's using murderer and, and the person that killeth, you know, synonymously, interchangeably. So the person that killeth, the murderer is put to death. And that's how the word kill is used and thou shalt not kill. It's talking about someone who commits murder. So someone that's guilty of the death penalty, they're not innocent. So you're not shedding innocent blood when you put a convicted criminal to death. Because you know, the whole point of the sermon tonight is we're looking at six things that God hates. Six things that are abominable in God's sight that, that we need to make sure. Obviously, this is something that will probably be easier for us to make sure that we're keeping ourselves from. But there's actually, you know, my first point here when we're looking at this hands that shed innocent blood, there's a lot of innocent blood that's being shed these days. And you think about the innocent, right? We just looked in the context of, okay, someone who's not a criminal, right? Not, not someone who's guilty of murder or whatever. Obviously, they're not innocent. But when I read this verse and I think about the shedding of innocent blood, I think about the innocence of a child, for example. Because children, let's face it, I mean, children are innocent. Right? Children don't know any better. Children don't know God's law you know, up to the, the age of accountability when they're able to really even comprehend what God's law is, what's right and what's wrong. The Bible says in Psalm 106, turn if you would to Exodus 21. Exodus 21, I'll read for you from Psalm 106, verse 37. The Bible reads, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So this is talking about the Canaanites that, that literally sacrificed their own children unto these false gods, these devils. And they thought they were doing what's right. They thought they were doing God's service by giving this great sacrifice of their own child, and they were killing their children. And offering up his everything. And their blood was being shed. And the Bible says that the land was polluted with their blood. And that is, that is something God hates. God hates the shedding of the innocent blood. But what about the unborn? I mean, that's talking about, about sons and daughters that were already born. God's laws, we see in Exodus 21, God has a law regarding a pregnant woman whose baby is killed. So if you have a woman that's with child... Let's see how the Bible deals with the act where, where the baby that is inside of the womb dies. Look at verse number 22. The Bible reads, If men strive 
and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Very, very clear message from the Bible that says, a woman with child, that is life. That is a life that's inside of the womb. Now, either way, we see the similar uh, type of reasoning when it says, if any mischief follow. Basically, it's saying, it, was this intentional or not? Because it gives us an example of two guys are fighting, right? They get in a brawl, they get in a fight, and you know, there's a, a woman with child is standing by, and maybe you know, someone gets knocked loose, and they, they hit her in the gut, and the baby dies, right? A horrible example. But if they're saying, okay, well, this happened, but it was, that was an accident, there's still a cry, you know, it's, something bad still happened, there's still a punishment to be paid. You know, that, that child died. But because it wasn't intentional, it was an accident, it's a much lesser punishment for that accident that had that accidental death, right? There's still a guilt involved because, I mean, you guys were fighting and, and you, you, know, you, you killed this child, but it wasn't what you intended to do, so it's more like a manslaughter type of a charge. It's something that was just unintentional, but it happened and it, and it was due to negligence. But what he's saying here is that if it was, if it was intentional for any reason, if there was a motive behind that, and someone intentionally took the life of a woman, which of the child inside of a woman's womb, he's saying, you give life for life, which is exactly the same as what you'd give for a murderer, for someone who takes any other person's life. The Bible's clear on this subject. There is no debate about it. You know, so many people, even Christians these days, are saying, oh, you know, they, they call the, the claim to be pro-choice or, or, you know, pro-life, but except for all these other exceptions stuff. Look, no, there are no exceptions. There are no reasons to kill a child inside of the womb. And I believe that anybody that takes the life of another person ought to be put to death, including people who are like the, the, the surgeons that remove, that go in and physically cut up the babies inside of the mother and take them out, that perform these wicked abortions. Amen. They ought to be put to death. If we followed God's laws, they would surely be put to death. And I'll tell you what, God hates the innocent blood that's being shed. It's wicked. It's disgusting. You know, these people are monsters. These doctors that like to downplay and call themselves pro-choice. If you ever listen to testimonies from abortion doctors that tell you the procedures that actually go on, it'll turn your stomach and make you want to lose your lunch. If you have any sense of morality at all. If you have any sense of, of right and wrong and if, and, and if you hear the details that they go into and you realize that's a life that's a baby somebody you know, hearing about a doctor going in with instruments and chopping off babies arms and legs how could you do that more than one time I can understand maybe once not realizing what you're doing being ignorant and just so stupid that you don't realize how far developed a baby is but the first time that you do that and you see there's an arm hey there's a leg what am I doing I'm killing a person these doctors are wicked as hell and they all deserve to be put to death devils. they are devils I get a little worked up about this because it's so wicked imagine how worked up God gets about this there is nothing more innocent than a child inside the womb that can't protect itself. There's nothing, there's no way of, of taking care of itself whatsoever. There's no voice for that child. It is the most vulnerable. And as you read the Bible, you'll realize how much God cares about those that are vulnerable. How much God looks out for the poor. He looks out for the fatherless. He looks out for the widows. He looks out for the needy. He cares about those people way more. He really does. He, has, he, he says, look, you better not touch those people. And the innocent blood, the innocent life inside of a womb, God gave that life. God is the giver of life. God's the one that opens and closes the womb. The women that become pregnant with a child, God gave you that baby and you're going to kill it? We hear these stupid politicians these days that want to dance around these issues and, and you know, when they're asked a direct question, well, what do you think should happen if you're so against abortion and you think it should be against the law, what should happen to the woman? 
and these spineless jerks that are politicians that just want to cater to what the majority of people think or say of their constituents or whatever it is that they think have no backbone and they don't they obviously don't care about what God says but the answer is not that difficult I don't have any sympathy for the woman that wants to go on news as far as I'm concerned she's an accessory to murder if you're gonna go in willingly to a doctor and say take this baby out of me I don't want it anymore this is the way that things need to be pushed now look I understand we live in a world where women have been deceived and they have been given propaganda and they've been told lies they've been told lies that it's not really a baby oh it's just a, it's just a bunch of cells that's gonna come out of you and that it's and it's not really a human being and it's not a baby and it's you know, all these different lies I understand that which is why we need to you know at least change laws and get the facts out there and get the get the reality of the situation out so, so women could understand no this is really what's happening you've been deceived you've been lied to but this is the truth there is a lie if if a, you know the Bible says that if a, if a woman loses her child and it was intentional that was in the womb God says that's a life and that's life for life and that you deserve to die and I don't care if it's because there's two guys fighting. I think it's even worse. I mean, that's bad enough that two guys are fighting. But if there's a doctor that's going to go in and take instruments and just, just kill that baby and remove it, you can't get any more intentional than that. That's the whole point of an abortion is you are just trying to kill a child. That's cold-blooded murder. God hates that. Second Kings, you don't have to turn to Second Kings chapter 24, verse 3 talking about the sins of Manasseh. In the Old Testament, the, over the children of Israel, there was a king, a real wicked king called Manasseh, right before the children of Israel were taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. The Bible says in verse 3 of 2 Kings 24, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. I'll tell you, my friends, today, the United States is filled with the blood of innocent children. By the millions, children being aborted. But the rest of that verse says... It says, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. God's merciful. God's long-suffering. God is forgiving. God gives people opportunities. But you know what he said? The innocent blood that was shed, the fact that you were giving your children through the fire and offering up these sacrifices of your sons and your daughters, I can't pardon that. I can't do it. Judgment is going to come upon you and it's going to come upon you severely. Because the innocent blood has cried out to God and God heard those cries. My friends, God is no different today. Innocent children are being slaughtered. The blood is being shed. God can't, if he couldn't pardon it then, he's not going to be able to pardon it now. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. There should be no doubt in anybody's mind about this topic. If, if there was before we started, by the end of the sermon, you should have zero doubt in your mind about how wicked abortions are. And we, I, would to God there be more men of God standing up and shouting against this wickedness and being able to present and teach the truth about these subjects so that the people wouldn't be ignorant and be deceived by the world, by a wicked, satanic world that's just all about killing the children and destroying the family. It's time we take a harder line on these sins. Look, if you truly love children, if you truly love the unborn child, you need to be hating these wicked acts. Don't get a little soft spot in yourself and this sympathy, oh, but you know, what's this woman gonna do? They're single and they, you know, they're young and they, you know, whatever, and they're not married, and it's gonna be hard for them to live. 
Okay, murder is never the answer. Never. Maybe if we could teach, you know what? There's consequences for your actions. Instead of just saying, oh, you made a mistake. Yeah, go ahead and murder. Because that'll make everything better. And you could read the stories of the women that go in and get abortions. It doesn't fix their problem. It actually makes things way worse. Because even if they get deceived and get told, after the procedures, they know, they know that it's not right. Inherently, inside, deep down inside of them, you know that it's not right. You always wonder and question, what did I just do? I've read stories, I've heard stories from people plenty of times that if they've done it in their past, in their youth, they've been lied to, their family tries to convince them and push them and do all these things, and you got other forces, you know, trying to get them to go and just get the abortion, get the abortion, they kind of, you know, they're in a daze, they don't know what's going on, they go through the abortion, and then, boom, it's, that's something they have to live with for the rest of their life. And it never fixes a problem. <coughs> Look at verse number 10 of Deuteronomy 19. The Bible reads, That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities, then the elders of the city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Look at verse 13. Because it's talking about somebody who's, he's committed a murder. And he ran away and he's trying to get into the city of refuge to be safe. He's, you know, he doesn't want to face up for his crime. And he says, no, here's what you need to do with that murder. You need to deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Look at verse 13. Thine eye shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. We can't have pity on these people, on these murderers, on these abortion doctors, on the people that are going through with this cold-blooded murder. You can't pity that. You can't start allowing that soft spot. You know what that tells me? Your love is waxing cold for the innocent when you start pitying the people that, that do these things. Right. There are certain things that just need to be unacceptable. Completely off the table. We're not even going to talk about this. There is no room for discussion here. It's wicked as hell. And we're not going to stand for it. And that person needs to be put to death. And that is the line that needs to be taken with people. I don't want to hear about your motivations. It's wrong. But, but it's wrong. You don't understand my situation. It's wrong. It's murder. We cannot get a soft spot for evil. The Bible says in Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Amen. Cleave to that which is good. Amen. We need to, you know what that word abhor? That is an extremely strong word for hate. So you think hate is strong enough? You say, oh, we're not supposed to hate. The Bible says abhor that which is evil. And the first part of that verse, it says, let love be without dissimulation. Let your love not be faked. Don't have a phony love. A real love, if you truly love something, it says you're going to abhor the evil. The more you love something, you have to hate the other. You have to hate the, the opposite, right? If you love life, you're going to hate the death. If you love the children, you're going to hate the abortions. You're going to have to abhor that which is evil. And we need to have that proper viewpoint. It's not just a difference of opinion. It's not, well, you think it's pro-choice and I think it's pro-life. No. No, I hate that. You're wicked. No. That's life. You don't have a choice in who you get to kill. It's a fake, false love if you don't abhor that which is evil. That's what the Bible says. Now, one more thing I want you to keep in mind on this subject. It's a lot easier to pin the blame on the doctor who's actually going through the procedures and you can see the body parts coming out. It's real clear to understand that that's wicked and that's wrong. But I'll tell you what, my friends, anytime you are killing a child, it's wrong. The later it is, the easier it is to, to identify, the later it is in the pregnancy, it's easier to understand that because you just start seeing a real person. The Bible teaches us that life begins the moment that that seed is conceived inside of a woman's womb. When the, when the seed is conceived, there is a life there. 
There is life that's given by God. And unfortunately, there are abortions that are going on in this country that don't involve a doctor. It doesn't involve a surgeon. There are abortions that are being done by women who are taking birth control pills. Again, another area, another aspect where people are being deceived. You're not being told the whole truth. You don't understand those things. You need to, first of all, read the things that you're taking. Read the little inserts that they give you because they're, they're required to, to disclose this information. But when you go into the Planned Parenthood or when you go into these other you know, clinics that do the abortions and that give out these pills for free, they don't tell you about all these things work. I'm going to read for you how the, the, the most common pill, you know, there's, there's different options out there for, for all these different birth control pills and things that you can take uh, to prevent yourself from getting pregnant. And I'm going to read for you how they work. Because they all basically have three mechanisms, well, two, two or three, depending on the pill, on, on how it's going to prevent a pregnancy. Because the pills are taken to prevent pregnancies. It's from people who don't want to have children to begin with. And the Bible says that, you know, children are in heritage of the Lord. Blessed is the man that has his quiver full. The Bible says the children are a blessing. It's a good thing to have. You shouldn't not want children in the first place. But people who don't want children, here, I'll read for you what this pill does. It says, pregnancy is prevented by a combination of factors. The hormonal contraceptive usually stops the body from ovulating. So the first point of doing is that if the egg's not produced, there's nothing to be fertilized. Okay? That's not the wicked part as far as the pill is concerned. But that's, that says, so one of the things is they, they give you a hormone. You're taking a hormone to try to stop your body from producing that egg so that no egg can't be fertilized. You can't have a baby. But going on, it says hormonal contraceptives also change the cervical mucus to make it difficult for the sperm to go through the cervix and find an egg. So they're saying, okay, we're going to make it more difficult for the conception to take place. But still, no life has been created yet. It's the third part. It says hormonal contraceptives can also prevent pregnancy by changing the lining of the womb so it's unlikely the fertilized egg will be implanted. Now it's talking about fertilization. Fertilization is the conception of the seed and the egg. Life has begun. And so what they do is they say, okay, the uterus... Because that, that, that conception, that new life, needs to get life from, from his mother. And what it does is it, is it attaches to the wall of the uterus. But what this drug does is it basically makes it a killing machine. And says, yeah, good luck trying to survive in this environment. And makes it so that it cannot get any, any life support. And in essence, what you're doing is now you're aborting a, a, a new life. Life is life regardless of the size. My son, Jonathan, he's no less of a person because he's much smaller than everybody else here. The life inside of a womb is no less of a person just because it's even smaller than my infant is. Life is still life. It doesn't matter when it takes place. It doesn't matter if it happens at seven months, one month, one week, one day, one hour. As soon as you have that life, that's life. It has become murder now when you're, taking, when you're taking a life and you are intentionally doing it. If I were to take my, my son and put him in a, in a box and put him out in the sun and just have no air, no hole or anything like that, you know, and just, just say, good luck fending for yourself out there, buddy. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a similar situation of what you're doing with, with the life that's trying to get, get sustenance inside of this womb after you've taken these pills because it makes it so that it cannot survive. Any environment I come up with to put my children in, that's what you're doing inside of the womb. So, you know, an environment where they can't get any type of life and you know they're going to die in there. I mean, there's no way. There's no way they could get out of it. That is why these, you know, these pills are, for one, they're so effective in preventing pregnancies but not preventing fertilization. See, you got it. The, the words they use are tricky too. So when you say, well, what's a pregnancy? Is that a pregnancy is after the implantation in the wall. That's what they'll define it as. And they'll, they'll throw around these terms real subtly to get you to think that, oh, they just prevent me from getting pregnant. And I know for, for myself, you know, 
with the limited knowledge that I had even growing up or hearing about any of this, all I ever heard was that, yeah, it prevents the egg from being produced. And that's, that's how it works. And that's what most people just think. So you're not thinking that there's life that has been created already. But no, the fact of it is, is that there is life. And it is created. Now, the liberals get everything backwards. They get all upset when you say that the homo should be executed. Right? They go, oh, oh, I can't believe you said that. What are you talking about? No, we need love. People get angry and they'll write me and say that I condone the murder of innocent people. Just because I believe that, that if a man lies with mankind, he lies with a woman, that he should be put to death. Because that's what the Bible says. That's what I believe. I believe that that should be the case. Amen. Just as much, and look, it's not that one thing. I know it's easy. I bring it up a lot because of our weird, perverted culture that we live in and this push of the agenda to, to just tolerate and, and accept all this perversion. So I, I bring it up more frequently. But that goes for every other punishment in the Bible. It's talking about the death penalty. That goes for the adulterer. That goes for the kidnapper. That goes for every other sin that the Bible is laying out that deserves a death penalty. Amen and amen. I believe God's word and I believe that that is justice. Amen. But people will get angry at me and they'll say, oh, you, think, you believe in murdering innocent people. But it's not innocent people. The homos are not innocent. They've committed a crime. They've committed a crime against God and against men. I mean, if, if they were innocent... God is a God of justice. He wouldn't have a punishment against an innocent person. Right. He wouldn't give the death penalty to someone that's innocent. No, my friends, they're not innocent. But the liberals, like I said, they have everything backwards. They get angry about that and they'll call those people innocent. But then the, the abortion doctor that wants to go in and literally chop up a little baby and take it out, they're saying, that's not murder. There's nothing wrong with that. Backwards. They call that which is evil good and good evil. They call that a choice. Not just a choice. It's not, that's not murdering. You're not, you're not murdering an innocent person. You're, you're, you've got that choice because it's your body. No, it's not your body. The baby that you're destroying inside your womb, that's not your body. So it's not your choice. In Genesis chapter, turn if you would to Jeremiah 51. See what happens like in, Je in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 9, when, when Cain killed Abel. God questioned Cain about this. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? You like that attitude that he has? I don't know where he's at. What, what am I his keeper? What, well, I just have to follow around what he's, everything he's doing? After he just killed his brother, that's the way you're going to talk to God? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. You may be able to hide what you do from other men, but you can't hide what you do from God. The innocent blood, God hates the shedding of innocent blood. He hates it. He abhors it. He judges nations for it. And no doubt the judgment will come in this country. But the innocent blood literally cries out to God. No matter how big or how small. So I've got a couple other points here. That was the, the number one thing that comes to my mind when the Bible talks about shedding innocent blood. The innocent is the children. It's the unborn. It's the, it's the, it's the people that cannot defend themselves. God hates shedding of innocent blood. But you know what? There is other innocent blood that is shed even besides children. You're in Jeremiah chapter 51. I just want to show you this before I get into my next point. We're going to transition a little bit here. We need to understand that God uses nations to judge other nations. And He always has. So like you think about uh, when He used Israel, for example, to judge the Canaanites. So... Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They wandered around the wilderness. And then Joshua led them into the promised land, the, God, the land that God was giving to them for an inheritance. But in order for them to receive that land, they had to kill the inhabitants of that land. I mean, they went to war and God said, destroy them. You know, man, woman, boy, girl, the animal, like destroy everything. He says, you need to wipe them out. 
And people get confused about this. Well, why would God do that? I thought God's a loving God. Why would he just, you know, why is he just giving them land? Well, what's so special about them? Why do they get the land and they just get to kill all these people? Well, the reason is because the people in that land were extremely wicked. So God used the children of Israel to bring his judgment upon another extremely wicked nation. And we get that when you read through the book of Leviticus and God's given all these, all these laws and he's saying, you know, not to be a homo and to put them to death and not to, you know, these people, um, it, it gives laws about bestiality and it gives laws about all these weird, perverted things. And the Bible says that the, children, the people of the land that were here before you, they did all those things. So you got to understand that when God, God brought his judgment because they were reprobate, they were, they were perverted, they were twisted. It was a wicked, wicked society that God was wiping out. So God was kind of killing two birds with one stone there. He was, he was giving the people that were following him a, a land, an inheritance for them to, to dwell in. At the same time, he was destroying a wicked people. So that's why God did that. But God uses you know, different you know, wars and different nations to bring his judgment upon others. He used Babylon then to judge Israel. Right? Israel went in, they judged the Canaanites after you know, hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, they get wicked. They start serving false gods and false idols. Well, what happened? They start killing babies. Well, God says, okay, now I'm going to use the Babylonians. And they're going to come in, and they're going to bring you into bondage, and I'm going to get my judgment that way. So God uses nations from time to time. We'll see that here in Jeremiah 51. Verse 19, the Bible says, The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe. Talking about the nation of Israel. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. And with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. With thee also will I break in pieces man and woman. And with thee will I break in pieces old and young. And with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee will I break in pieces the husband and his yoke oxen. And with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. And on and on. And it goes on and on about that. But... God uses nations to bring his judgment. Now, in Jeremiah 51, he's talking about Israel then bringing judgment back on the Babylonian Empire. Because the Babylonian Empire was wicked. No doubt about that. They were not righteous. Now, they were carrying out the sentence, you know, God's vengeance upon other people that needed to be judged. But they were not righteous. God used a wicked nation to do that. So don't think for a second today that if God wants to judge this country as he's done with many other nations in the past, that he can't use someone even more wicked than we are. He could bring in someone, he could bring in, you know, these, these Muslims, he could bring in ISIS. If that's how he wants to judge our nation, you say, but ISIS is extremely wicked. Yeah, I know they are. Of course they are. But God can use those people to bring judgment upon people who he wants to bring judgment upon. But then they'll get what's coming to them also. Nobody just gets out of these things. When God is going to bring his judgment, people are going to get judged. But where's the innocent blood then? Okay, God's bringing judgment. And, and I bring this up because there are examples that you might want to say, it, within the United States, where we've gone to war, you might want to say that, yeah, but see, we were being used of God to bring judgment upon other people. When the judgment is being done, it's one thing, but you, you, you always still need to be doing it righteously. Now, we fight wars these days very unrighteously. Right. The way that wars are fought, you know, the way that wars used to be fought, people would go to battle and they would literally, physically fight each other. You would see your opponent, you know, the, the person that you're fighting, and you'd be fighting to the death. And you know what? There's some honor to that. There's some respect to that, to where you are literally fighting somebody. These days, we send machines to go drop bombs and just destroy everything in its path, whatever it just lands on. Well, that's the way we fight wars these days. You got people literally sitting in front of little computers like they're playing a video game and flying these drones into areas where they just drop bombs. And what happens as a result? Innocent people lose their lives. See, in a war, when you're battling against someone from another army, you don't consider those people innocent, 
right? I mean, they're there to fight. You're there to fight, and you have the war. You have the battle for whatever reason. You know, uh, I believe that that wars of defense. If you are on the defense and people are aggressing against you, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with defending yourself and being out there in the battle and fighting. But when you're innocent, when you're not in the power of the battle at all, you're just, you know. Your government's doing something. They're going to war with people. I don't want anything to do with that. You know, I'm not going to go defend this government because they're getting into wars with people. I'm going to go do my own thing. And then you just get killed because you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's innocent blood. A lot of people don't realize this, but since our time, I went and got some statistics on just the war in Iraq. Now look, We've been at wars in Libya, Iraq, Iraq, all these different places. There's places that don't even get any, any media attention that, we've, that we are bombing and, and having military uh, intervention with. And people going in and lives being killed. And no one even knows about it. Because our military is all over the place. Just like the Babylonian Empire was, was become, you know, became this one world government, the United States is starting to become a, a, a government that controls the whole world. And it's not a good thing. It's not righteously. For the war in Iraq, the, um, I found a statistic that says there have been approximately 165,000 Iraqi civilians killed by direct violence since the U.S. invasion. 165,000 people, not combatants, not people that they even claim had a gun. I mean, who knows how many times that you know, guns are being, oh yeah, we were under fire or whatever, when, when mistakes were made. This is like, this is what's reported. And you know that these numbers are underreported. You know that they're going to tone down these figures. But 100, even 165,000 people, they had nothing to do with the war. They just were living, whatever, they're civilians. <laughs> Dead. Why? It's because of our tactics. It's because of our wars these days. Now we're dropping bombs. We're, we're killing people that it's not righteous. It's innocent blood that's being shed. Uh, the, the, continuing on with these statistics with the website I found, it says the actual number of civilians killed by direct and indirect war violence is unknown but likely much higher in the hundreds of thousands. The fighting continues and life-threatening damage to Iraqi health care and other infrastructure has not been repaired. Civilians are still dying in significant numbers. Now look, I'm not some person that just says, like, peace at all costs, okay? I am for war when war is necessary, but these wars, that these, these interventions that we're getting involved in the Middle East have nothing to do with our safety. That's just lies and propaganda that's been fed to you from our government, the wicked government, from the people that have the money, that are making money off of these wars. The people that own these contracts, the military contracts, they get paid billions of dollars from your tax money, by the way, to get these, these great contracts. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. To, to lie to the people, to go over and say, oh, no, we need to go in here because if we don't go in here, you know, Mr. Uh, terrorist that's living in a cave is going to come and get you. So they designed these false flags attacks like 9-11 or you know, the Gulf of Tonkin or all these other false flags that are, that are put up there that are promoted by the media to get the people to say, oh yeah, we need to go to war because they attacked us and we, we're not going to let them attack us. And as a result now, hundreds of thousands of innocent blood has been shed. Another example, you know, this, this will probably upset people because these days, you know, you get, it's one thing to talk about the Iraq war because it's just so obvious what that was about. You, know, it's, you see the, 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 the profits and oil, profit, you know, all these different motivations to go and go to war. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. Even at the time, people were going, why are we going to war here? Like, I thought it was in Afghanistan. You know, what, yeah. Why are we going to war with Iraq? Why are we fighting Saddam Hussein? I thought it was Osama bin Laden. Doesn't make any sense. It's obvious. But what about when we step it back to, to the World War II era? I don't think it's any more righteous what we did in, the, in that time. And a little bit. No, it was a little bit. Okay. When they're actually fighting, people were fighting soldiers, and there wasn't as much innocent blood being shed. But how about the innocent blood that was shed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? When the United States decided to drop atomic bombs 
on villages. Not on military institutions. I mean, people just live there. People of another race just live there. And we're dropping bombs. I, I read this. Here, I'll read this for you. On the bombing of civilians, it says, Within the first two to four months of the bombings, the acute effects of the atomic bombings killed 90,000 to 146,000 people in Hiroshima and 39,000 to 80,000 in Nagasaki. Roughly half of the deaths in each city occurred on the first day. During the following months, large numbers died from the effect of burns, radiation sickness, and other injuries compounded by illness and malnutrition. In both cities, most of the dead were civilians, although Hiroshima had a sizable military garrison. So we're saying, well, there was a military at Hiroshima. Okay, there, there, was, there was a military base there. But the vast majority of the people that died were just innocent civilians. And our wicked government decided to say, you know, we're going to drop a bomb on those people. How wicked can you be? Dropping a bomb and instantly killing people that, that have nothing to do with your stupid war. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And he's not going to hold them guiltless that shed the innocent blood. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 109. It's the last place we'll turn tonight. Because now we're going to turn to the innocent blood of Jesus. You want to talk about innocent blood? We talk about the children, you know, innocent blood. Jesus Christ was sinless. The Bible says that he knew no sin. He was without sin. Amen. Jesus Christ did everything right. The Bible says, I, you know, I do always those things that please my Father. Jesus Christ always did the right thing. He always did the right thing and he didn't sin. You know, this morning I preached a sermon on sins of omission, things that you are supposed to be doing, but when you don't do them, they're a sin. Jesus Christ didn't have any sins of omission or commission. He didn't break any commandments, and he actually listened and did all the things that God wanted him to do, every single one of them. He was perfect. He deserved no punishment. He deserved none of those things. He deserved to be crowned king and leading the people. But obviously we know there was a plan behind it. We know that he came in order to sacrifice himself and in order for his blood to be shed in order to atone for our sins and that we could all be saved through his grace, through the great blood that he shed for us, that innocent blood that will cleanse our, our dirty, wicked, sinful blood. And praise the Lord for that. But woe to the man that is responsible for the shedding of blood. Now we're going to read a curse here in Psalm 109. This curse is about Judas Iscariot. He's the one responsible for shedding the blood of the innocent. Just to give you an idea uh, here, exemplified of God's hatred for the shedding of innocent blood. Now you could say, yeah, but he needed to do that. Yeah, I know he needed to do that. The Bible says, you know, offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. So we know that in the world there's going to be bad things that happen, but it doesn't make it right for you to do the bad things. You say, but Jesus had to come and pay for our sins. Yeah, I know. But Judas was still wicked and in sin for betraying Christ and for, you know, basically he was being ultimately responsible for shedding the innocent blood. Now there's other people involved and had their hands in that shedding of innocent blood too. And they're not guiltless either. But in Psalm 109, we're going to see, we're going to read through this a little bit. And just so you know, the reason how we know that this is talking about Judas is in verse number um, verse number 8. Look at that verse number 8. It says, Let his days be few and let another take his office. This is quoted in Acts chapter 1, verse 20. The Bible says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. So when it says here, let another take his office, it's the same thing of his bishopric let another take. This is the psalm it's referring to. You won't find this anywhere else. And this is when they were replacing Judas in the book of Acts with someone that was going to take his place. They say, well, no, someone else has to take his office because he was one of the twelve. And, but let's read this starting in verse number four of Psalm 109. The Bible reads, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. 
Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. This is talking about Jesus Christ. He had love for us, but he was dealt with hatred. And now he's saying, look, when he's judged, let him be condemned. Let his prayer become sin. And this is what it's like for a reprobate, for someone who's rejected, for someone who's a devil. Okay? With someone that it's too late for them. When Jesus gets to the point where he's like, I don't care what they're saying. When they pray to you, let it become sin. We just went over this in Proverbs chapter 1, if you remember, when God's going to laugh at their calamity. God's going to mock when their fear comes. People that, they've had an opportunity. Hey, God love them. God's reaching out his hand. He's like, come on. I've got my hand stretched out for you. Just take it. They didn't want to have anything to do with God. God just could say, okay, fine, have it your way. You don't want salvation? You don't want wisdom? You don't want any of that stuff? We'll see what happens. And when you call on me, I'm not going to hear it. Let his prayer become sin. Verse number eight, let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth because that he remembered not to show mercy but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. That's a serious curse. I mean, he's saying like, don't hear him, destroy everything he has, destroy his family, destroy his good, his wealth, everything. Just curse it all and give him no out. That's the man that shed innocent blood, the innocent blood of Jesus Christ specifically. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. We ought to hate it too. We ought not to stand for it. Whether it's the innocent blood of, of the unjust wars and the civilians that are being killed, or whether it's the innocent blood of the children that are being sacrificed, especially the children that are being sacrificed. They need a voice. People need to, to not... to. We need to counteract the brainwashing that's going on there. We need to be a source of information and truth to people who have, don't have the truth, that don't understand how wicked this is. And we need to make sure that we don't budge and don't have pity on those that deserve, according to the Bible, the death penalty. That we don't just have a soft spot for that sin, but we abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Dear God, your great words of wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to take the hard line and the hard stance on these topics, dear God. I know there's a lot of emotions involved in all of these issues. And there's people that are touched personally by these things, dear Lord. And it's a hard truth to swallow sometimes, especially for those, dear God, I don't know if there happens to be any ladies in here that, that maybe have, have dealt with this specifically, dear God. I would believe that it's, it was probably through ignorance that it happened to begin with. Lord, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to, to be able to spread the truth and to counteract all the lies that are given to your Lord. And um, we thank you for, for truly being loving and merciful and forgiving, dear Lord. And, and I pray that if anyone is guilty of any of these things, that they would um, just confess and forsake their sin, dear Lord, and, and be able to um, know that they could continue to serve you. But um, Lord, we, we need to maintain the truth on these matters and not shy away from them, dear God, and to be able to be steadfast in standing for what's right and what's just. Dear God, give us the strength to do so and continue to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.